Hello everyone, welcome to your talking newspaper for Friday 3rd of August. I'm Howard. And I'm Chris. Society news to start with then. Uh, Tuesday, unfortunately the Right Swimming Group will not be meeting on Tuesday 7th of August. We apologise for any inconvenience. Wednesday, the Audiobook Group will be meeting at Lord Louis Library in Newport on Wednesday the 8th of August, 2pm until 3pm. Come and join us to talk about last month's book enjoy refreshments and get a copy of the book for next month. There's no charge to attend the group. For more information, please call Laura Jasper on 522205 or email members at iwsb.org.uk. Any other news? Please note, there will be no activities taking place at Millbrook House throughout August. All groups will restart in September. To support our recruitment drive for volunteers, we will be advertising our vacancies on a regular basis in the hope that you may have a friend, relative, neighbour or contact who could be interested in volunteering with the Society. We have approximately 85 active volunteers who support the Society in many ways to provide the services we offer to our members. Our volunteer team are committed to their volunteer roles and have fun and social interaction along the way, which is of mutual benefit to everyone involved. Current vacancies are minibus drivers, dress for less retail support, escorts on our minibus, events ambassadors to support at island-wide events, Fundraising by way of bucket collections at island supermarkets. Sighted guides for our monthly and varied island walks. And my guide, sighted guide escorts. Please contact Michelle Taylor, volunteer manager, on 522205 or email volunteers at iwsb.org.uk for further details. Scaffolding news. Here's a list of known footway obstructions for works, including scaffolding or hoarding. We're unable to include end dates, as many are extended on a week-by-week basis. Also included are tables and chairs permits that have been issued in the past week. The Bay and Ventnor area. There's currently scaffolding at Premier Inn, 1 to 9 Esplanade, Sandown, 11A and 11B, St John's Road, Sandown, the Toymaster, 103 High Street, Sandown, Scaffold up in Albion Road, 1 Station Avenue, Sandown, the Castle Pub, 12 to 14 Fitzroy Street, Sandown, Bar 64, High Street, Shanklin, Corner of Trinity Road and Madeira Road, Ventnor, Bonifast Road and into Trinity Road, Ventnor, Hose Roads, Dixon, 1 High Street, Ventnor, 2 Eleanor House, Grove Road, Ventnor. There are currently hoardings at Premier Inn, 1 to 9 Esplanade, Sandown. There are currently skips at 11A Steep Hill Court Road, Ventnor, 27 Clarendon Road, Shanklin, 3 Clarence Road, Shanklin, adjacent Coastal Mobility, 56 Regent Street, Shanklin. New scaffolding is due up at Railway Bridge, Avenue Road, Sandown, from 10th of September. Cows area. There is currently scaffolding at 91 High Street, Cows, 93 High Street Cows behind the hoarding, Sainsbury's 129 to 130 High Street Cows, 78 Park Road Cows, Geraldine's 3 York Avenue East Cows, Cows Library Beckford Road Cows, also up in West Hill Road. There are currently hoardings at 93 High Street Cows, There are currently skips at 101 Pallance Road, Northwood, and 40 Vectis Road, East Cows. The Newport area that's currently scaffolding at 18 Lugley Street, Newport, 46 to 48 Lugley Street, Newport, Domino's, St. James's Street, Newport, Unit 2, 32 to 39 High Street, Newport, now only up at rear of shop in St. Thomas Square, Hurst and Son, Lugley Street, Newport, Scaffold up in Lugley Street and Holyrood Street, Age UK 145 High Street, Newport, 114 Pyle Street, Newport, 
82 to 86 Carisbrook High Street, Newport. There's a cherry picker at 79 to 81 Pyle Street, Newport. New scaffolding is due up at 67 Castle Road, Newport. Scaffold up in Clarendon Street from 15th of August. Ride area. There is currently scaffolding at Boots, 170 for High Street Ride, Hills Court, High Street and Newport Street Ride, 18 George Street Ride, 73 George Street Ride, 23 St John's Road Ride and 12 The Anchorage Sea View. New scaffolding is due up at 137A High Street Ride from the 21st of August. A new crane is due up at 19 Albert Street Ride from the 2nd of September. West White area, there's currently scaffolding at Jojo's School Green Road, Freshwater, and there are currently skips at Christmas Cottage, Guyers Road, Freshwater, Flat A Bourne House, Churchill, Topland. New skips are due at 10 Heathfield Road, Freshwater from 23rd of August. This week's In Touch. In Touch in this week's episode, Transport Minister Nazrat Ghani, we're on the move this week as the government launches a new inclusive strategy to improve travel for disabled people. We talked to Minister Nazrat Ghani about what it means for blind and visually impaired people. With a pause, called on the creation of so-called shared spaces, new funding for transport staff training and more audio announcements on buses, we dig into the challenges of travel. And following on from Manchester Airport's assessment as poor in a civil aviation assessment of the experiences of disabled people, we talked to Chief Operating Officer Tricia Williams about how she plans to put it right. And the health software company Epic Systems Corporation has already forged relationships with the NHS Trust in the UK, but over in America it's facing legal action from the National Federation of the Blind over its technology, which they say is not taking screen readers into account and putting blind people's jobs at risk. The Federation's Chris Danielson tells us more. This is presented by Peter White and produced by Kevin Core. And now articles from today's County Press. That's Friday the 3rd of August. The first one, this is not the image we want to convey about our town. That's the message from senior politicians and business leaders in Cowes on the eve of Cowes Week after a shocking video emerged of a man being savagely beaten in the town's high street. The attack, last Thursday, July 26th, is the second violent incident to rock Cowes in under a week. Last Tuesday, an 18-year-old was stabbed twice in the back and suffered a punctured lung. Police are investigating the latest incident, which happened in the High Street near Bath Road shortly before 11.30pm. The graphic footage appears to show the man, who was walking his dog, being hit with a glass bottle before being thrown to the ground and repeatedly punched in the face. Mayor of Cowes and Isle of Wight Magistrate, Councillor Paul Fuller, said the attacks were absolutely not the sort of impression Cowes wanted to create so close to Cowes Week when sailors from across the globe converge for the world-famous regatta. Councillor Fuller said, we have to do everything we can to make sure events like this don't happen. He also called for local policing to be better resourced. He said, I don't know whether Cowes is better or worse than anywhere else. I want to work with the police to make sure the police service is properly resourced. Deputy Chair of Cowes Business Association, Mark McNeil, also called for more police in the town. He said there are nowhere enough police. They do what they can with the resources they have. It's not a usual event in Cowes, but there have been a couple of unpleasant incidents, to put it mildly. We can hope the police will be keeping a very close watch on what happens. Hopefully everybody will come here to enjoy themselves and have a great regatta. Deputy Mayor of Cowes and Isle of Wight Council Member, Councillor Laura P.C. Wilcox, added, I think it's really sad. All these years and we've never had incidents like this. I just don't remember it being this terrible. A police spokesperson said of the latest incident, 
A 41-year-old man was assaulted by a teenage boy, causing lacerations to his head. Inquiries are ongoing and no arrests have been made. A video of the attack can be seen on the CP website at www.iwcp.co.uk. Lucky escape from raging inferno. A West White couple asleep in bed had a lucky escape when a huge fire broke out just yards from their house. Charlie and Di Clark were confronted by a raging inferno which had engulfed their wood store just four yards from their freshwater home and threatened to ignite an oil tank containing 300 gallons of kerosene. They had been woken by the arrival of three fire engines which had raced to Wilmingham Lane just after 6am on Saturday. The fire which could have could have had a devastating effect on their lives and their property is believed to have been started by an electrical fault and it quickly took hold in the parched conditions after the recent hot weather. At its height, 12 firefighters battled to control the flames. Mr Clark said, The first we knew about it was when we heard the fire engines come up the drive. We were lucky they were called by Andrew Holliman, a customer service assistant at Freshwater Co-op, on his way to work. The fire started in our wood store, which was quite full in readiness for the winter. It then spread under an adjoining workshed, melting a water pipe and lots of electrical equipment. It has caused thousands of pounds worth of damage. A tree behind the wood store took the brunt of the blaze, otherwise it would have spread to a copse behind us and sparked a huge fire. Thankfully, the wind blew the fire away from the house. If it had come from the other direction, it would have taken out our oil tank, risking the house. It was terrifying. When we came down, it was like a red-hot inferno. We were both left shaking afterwards. Every time the firemen tried to pull out bits of the shed, it just all flared up again. They spent a good hour damping it all down. Even after they left, I had to put my hose on it. We had a really lucky escape. Charities are being invited to apply to the Isle of Wight County Press for funding to help bring lasting benefits to the island community. The Gannett Foundation is the charitable arm of Gannett Co. Inc., the parent company of NewsQuest Media Group, one of the UK's largest publishers and owners of the county press. It provides funding to registered charities in the areas where it operates local newspapers and websites. It supports registered charities with projects which take a creative approach to fundamental issues such as neighbourhood improvements, local problem solving, economic development, youth enterprise, sport and healthy living, assistance to disadvantaged or disabled people, care of the elderly, environmental conservation and educational or cultural enrichment. It values projects that bring lasting benefits to communities served by New- NewsQuest local newspapers and websites. Last year's Isle of Wight allocation of £5,000 went to Haven Street Community Centre. While preference may be given to ideas which create a durable legacy for the community, consideration will be given to single events or projects of limited duration that otherwise meet the criteria. Applications can be of any size or ambition. Typically the grants are modest sums for practical projects, but awards to larger projects which deserve backing will be considered. The Foundation is able to join other contributors to support elements of larger projects, but prefer to make a donation to fund a project entirely or which constitutes the final instalment to complete a project. Decisions about funding will be made by the trustees based on the evidence submitted. The Foundation will favour projects that demonstrate good planning, oversight and financial responsibility. As a prerequisite, copies of the charity's most recent financial accounts are required. In addition, any supporting materials and further details concerning the overall aims of the charity should be included with each submission. Each nomination will be judged on its own merits at the absolute discretion of the trustees whose decision is final. Applications must be submitted on the approved application form which can be downloaded at www.iwcp.co.uk. 
any applications do, which do not meet our criteria or which do not follow our rules and procedures will be rejected. The completed form and supporting documents should be sent electronically via email to grant at iwcp.co.uk. Submissions on paper are not encouraged, but if unavoidable, they can be sent to the Isle of Wight County Press, Brannan House, 123 Pile Street, Newport, Isle of Wight, PO301ST. All applications must arrive by 5pm on Monday, October the 8th, 2018. Man hit police officer with bottle. A ride man who assaulted a police officer with a bottle has been given a two-year community order. At the Isle of Wight Magistrates Court, Ryan Paul Darren Bentley, 23, of Thornton Manor Drive, pleaded guilty to the assault, which took place on July the 24th. Vivian Ducey, prosecuting, said two officers had tried to enter Bentley's room, but he had refused them entry. Fearing harm to the other residents, one officer entered the room, the door closing behind him. Bentley then approached him with an alcohol bottle, striking him on the wrist when he raised his arm. Reading a sp statement from the police officer, Mr Ducey said, I immediately had shooting pains in my right wrist. The officer was later treated for bruising at the, of the bone and muscle at St Mary's Hospital. Bentley had previously failed to complete community work for a previous charge, doing 12 out of the required 80 hours over six months. In mitigation, Liz Miller said, he did not think the officer had the right to enter his room. He has told me going to prison would be the worst thing in the world and he would probably kill himself. She added Bentley had mental health problems that meant he was crying out for help. Bentley was fined £150. Magistrate Stephen Howe said that £150 will be paid to the officer who suffered the injury. The Isle of Wight has lost 10 of its pubs since 2010. The figures from the Office of National Statistics show in 2010 there were 130 pubs and bars but by 2017 that had fallen to 120. Pubs have been pointing the finger of blame at the taxman for their troubles, complaining about the duty on beer, VAT levels and the cost of business rates. Britain's Beer Alliance, a group of organisations in the pub and brewing sector, has started a campaign called Long Live the Local with a petition and calls for people to write to their MP to have beer duty reduced. Camera, the campaign for Real Ale, said pubs play a vital role in communities. Tom Stainer, the Chief Communications Officer, said in many areas and villages they provide the last remaining public meeting space with meeting halls and post offices already lost. Last Bank Closes The last of the big four banks in Freshwater is to close at the end of the year. Lloyds Bank, which is open three days a week, claims the decision has been taken due to the changing ways customers are banking. There will be a mobile banking service, full details of which have yet to be confirmed. A Lloyds Bank spokesman said, We apologise for any inconvenience this may cause and will be speaking to customers about the new mobile branch service, which will be on the road before the branch closes. The new mobile branch service will provide a vital service to the freshwater area by giving customers access to everyday banking services such as making deposits, withdrawing cash and paying bills. Customers can also continue to access their banking locally by visiting the nearby post office. Jill Kennett, Chair of Freshwater Parish Council said, We have now lost the only bank west of Carisbrook. It's all right saying there is the post office or a mobile bank, but you haven't got any confidentiality at a mobile bank. And what about our shopkeepers who need their change? A power cut hit Ventnor on Monday evening. The fault was first reported shortly after 7.30pm, affecting addresses in the P038 area. By 8pm, 18 postcode areas remained without electricity. 
Scottish and Southern Energy said supplies were restored by 9.30pm. The company said our engineers were on site working to get the power back on as quickly as they could. An obituary for Mary Ellis. There are few island residents who would not have heard of Mary Ellis, perhaps one of our most renowned centenarians. Her incredibly brave and honourable time spent with the Air Transport Auxiliary ATA during the Second World War has been well documented and covered in many forms of media. During the war, Mary delivered over 1,000 planes, including Spitfires and Wellington bombers, equipped with just a compass, a stopwatch and a map. Mary delivered the very first meteor jet when seconded to the RAF at, sorry, when seconded to the RAF at the end of the war. She was told, you will run out of fuel in about 35 minutes, so make sure you're down by then. Needless to say, she made sure she was. What is not as well known is why Mary settled on the Isle of Wight rather than return to Bryce Norton after the war. In April 1949, Mary was employed on the island by Mr Clark, who originally appointed her as his private pilot to fly him to his various farms and agricultural shows across the country. However, quickly realising the potential Mary had to offer, he bought Sandown Airport and asked Mary to run the airfield. Between 1951 and 1968, she transformed the airport into a commercial success. Not only did she set up a flying school specialising in teaching women to fly, but Mary worked hard to meet the standards and safety requirements for aircraft such as DC-3s, Herons, Rapids and Doves to land at the airport. This enabled her to develop her own form of package holidays, bringing visitors to the island and organising buses to take passengers to and from their hotels, as is now done all over the world. Mary kept sheep as airstrip lawn mowers, and when she was recently awarded the freedom of the Isle of Wight, it gave her great amusement that it came with the right to drive her sheep down Newport High Street. Mary ran Sandown Airfield until it was sold in 1968. She then joined her husband, Donald Ellis, who was working in the Middle East for British hovercraft. Despite moving to a country where women were not allowed to drive a car, let alone fly a plane, Mary turned the situation to her advantage and was well known and appreciated for welcoming visitors and hosting the most wonderful parties. She loved Donald and was proud when he was awarded an OBE for his services in promoting the British hovercraft. On their return to the UK, they came home to the Isle of Wight, where together they ran their pleasure flight business from the airport for many years. Mary lived life to the full. In the two weeks before she died peacefully at her home, she was out every day attending various engagements, including the London premiere of Spitfires and as a guest of honour at the RAF Club. At Mary's 100th birthday celebration, she was asked what her favourite aircraft was. She said with true conviction, the Spitfire, as it symbolises freedom. So, fly free Mary, and we can but hope you are having a sherry in heaven with your beloved Donald, Sister T Tiny, and your many friends who will be waiting for you to give them one of your warm, beautiful smiles. What do you get someone for their 80th birthday? A skydive isn't the first thing which springs to mind, but that's exactly what the family of Mabel Woodman decided to treat her to. Intrepid Mabel, who will be 80 in December and stands just 4 foot 9 inches tall, enjoyed an early birthday present this week when she did a skydive along with two other generations of her family. She took to the skies and shared the experience with her son Bill Woodman, 56, his wife Dawn, 43, Dawn's mother, Kath Towlson, 65, Mabel's grandsons, Jake Woodman, 25, and Connor Woodman, 22, and family friend, Beck Salmon. Watching from the ground was the fourth generation, Jake's daughters Maddie, 18 months, 
and Poppy Mabel, three weeks old, who was named after her great-grandmother. They were accompanied by other family and friends. Mabel said, It was great. I really enjoyed the whole thing. It was better than a birthday cake. I know the island well, but I was amazed to see what it looked like from up there. It was all farmland, fields and empty spaces. I have a few bruises from my harness, but other than that I'm okay, and I'd do it again for my 90th birthday. I'd recommend it to everybody. Fire cover concerns. Mainland firefighters were drafted in to help tackle last week's fly fire blaze at St Lawrence, sparking renewed concerns about the shortage of local cover. Controversial plans to overhaul the fire service were shelved by the Isle of Wight Council in April, after the FBU warned cutting crews and reducing the number of firefighters would put lives at risk. The Isle of Wight Labour Party has called for assurances revised proposals which are being drawn up would not include axing firefighter jobs, assurances the council was unable to give. Labour claimed last Wednesday's fire, which spread across the cliffs at Undercliff Drive, highlighted a lack of resources, but the council said island crews were still able to provide the minimum level of cover. A council spokesman said, As the fire required a large number of appliances, the fire service requested support from Hampshire as a precaution. These arrangements are in place to increase fire cover across the island when large or protected incidents or protracted incidents occur. The, no decision has yet been made on the revised re, restructure. The spokesman said, the service review is designed to improve public safety and has involved staff and representative bodies, including trade unions. It will go back to the Council Cabinet before the final green light is given. Labour Vice Chair Sue Lyons said, I'm sure Isle of Wight residents will be as shocked and concerned as we are to learn it is necessary to bring mainland crews over to the island to tackle routine fires as a regular occurrence. We believe it is not uncommon to have only three available crews covering the whole island. That is clearly not acceptable. Does the council believe staffing levels are safe and then there are plans to reduce the number of firefighters at a time when resources are already clearly stretched? Lives are at stake here. We need assurances from the Council. Its first priority is saving lives, not saving money. A Ventnor ice cream parlour has been named the very best in the UK by TripAdvisor. Crave Ice Cream on Spring Hill was top of the list released this week based on the reviews and opinions of TripAdvisor travellers. TripAdvisor released the list during the hottest week of the heatwave and said... We all love a glorious sunny, sunny summer's day, but of course we wouldn't be British if we didn't moan about it being too hot, and what better way to cool down than with a frozen treat. All the ice cream at Crave Ice Cream is made on the premises with flavours changing daily. No one is left out. There are gluten-free and dairy-free options available too. One TripAdvisor traveller said, Fantastic ice cream shop, always queues, but always worth the wait. Different flavours available every time you visit, Happy for you to taste everyone if you need or want to. Lovely customer service. Crave is run by husband and wife team Chris and Tracy Holbrook, who make all the ice creams themselves and have created an incredible 800 flavours, including more than 90 dairy-free options suitable for vegans. Tracy said, We're overwhelmed to be top on TripAdvisor, but we wouldn't be there if it wasn't for all our lovely customers who've written such lovely things. They encourage us to be the best and come up with new flavours, so it's all thanks to them. We cater for everybody, children and adults, and for all allergens and dietary requirements. Crave's top five most popular ice creams are 1. Kinda Madness 2. Themed ice creams such as Lego, Mermaids and Star Wars 3. Cinnamon and Churros 4. Alcoholic flavours such as Bailey's or Tia Maria and 5. Bakewell Tart. GP surgeries at breaking point. 
More GP surgeries could face the same fate as Sandown Medical Centre, a health boss has warned. Dr Timothy Whelan, Deputy Clinical Chair of the Isle of Wight Clinical Commissioning Group, said some surgeries were at breaking point. Speaking at the Isle of Wight Health and Wellbeing Board meeting last Thursday, he said the island had a real problem with recruitment and retention of GPs and nurses. He said, We have heard about Sandown having to close their lists and I would say around the country too. It's not just an Isle of Wight problem. There remain men practices which feel they are just one incident away from collapse. That is certainly the case on the island. I have been speaking to quite a few practices which are really struggling, every bit as much as Sandown, and we can only hope Sandown is now given the breathing space to reorganise itself and to reopen and provide the full service that it used to. We need to be aware the same fate could quite quickly befall other practices. Fears have been raised the island's GP's recruitment crisis is spiralling out of control and last week Sandown Medical Centre closed its list to new patients except where they are immediate family members of existing patients due to a shortage of doctors. The clinic hopes to reopen the list this autumn after taking on a newly qualified doctor. The centre applied to close its list for 12 months but only a six month closure was approved. Dr Whelan said the crisis was a reflection of a wider national problem. With the Council, we share all these woes, he said. There has been quite a lot to say about housing. The health and well-being of every population has remarkably little to do with doctors and nurses. But housing, education, employment and transport and, of course, the Council has major influence over those factors. These factors were also affecting recruitment. Why would good doctors or nurses looking for a job come to the island when they discover the, sco the schools, limited employment, opportunities for partners and the housing stock is rather limited? Amid soaring profits, Whitelink could be sold for an estimated £300 million, sparking outrage the ferry companies are milking the island dry. During the year up to March 2017, Whitelink made a before-tax profit of £17.7 million. This was up from £13.7 million the previous year and £10 million the year before that. Commenting on the company's profits, Whitelink's chief executive Keith Greenfield said, Whitelink's profits have increased in recent years. This is how we're able to fund £45 million investment in a new ferry and port infrastructure and can attract further investment in future services. Red Funnel has seen a similar increase in profit. The latest available accounts show the company made a profit before tax of £14 million for the year up to December 2016, which is up from £10.3 million for the year before. Julian Critchley, Chair of Isle of Wight Labour, said these figures should shock islanders. Between them, Whitelink and Red Funnel extracted more than £30 million in profit from our island economy in a single year. To put that into context, we're seeing the Council cut our public services by £19 million over the next three years, causing tremendous hardship for children, vulnerable adults and our communities, while in the same period as their profits relentlessly rise, the ferry companies could extract over £100 million from our local economy to pay dividends to wealthy shareholders both in this country and overseas. We're being held hostage by two companies which treat us as their cash cow and they're milking us dry. Mr Critchley said Island Labour would campaign to bring the ferry companies into public ownership so those profits can be reinvested into more frequent and cheaper services. In his manifesto, Isle of Wight MP Bob Seeley said, the owners of the ferry firms do exceptionally well at the expense of the island. I do recognise they have tried up to a point to be good citizens to the island and they do help to drive traffic and tourism. They do also put money back into the island, about £1 million per year, 
although this is poor return for the island given the size of their profits. Overall, the firm's shareholders have been prioritised over the needs of islanders. However, Mr Seeley said there was little interest in government for nationalisation or further regulation. According to the Sunday Times, there's a booming demand for infrastructure assets as ultra-low interest rates and weak gilt yields have seen values increase dramatically. Basalt Infrastructure Partners, which bought Whitelink in 2015 for about £230 million, is trying to cash in on this demand. Rival Red Funnel was sold last year for a rumoured £320 million to investors, including West Midlands Pension Fund. Local authority pension funds have been buying up infrastructure assets recently, so Whitelink could be attractive. Garden Stars on TV Ventnor Botanic Garden will feature in next week's episode of Gardener's World. During filming, presenter Mark Lane joined curator Chris Kidd for a stroll around the olive grove and Mediterranean garden to take a look at the specialist plants growing there. The show will be broadcast on BBC Two at 9pm next Friday, August the 10th. An autistic teenager said she was so badly let down by social services she was driven to contemplate suicide. The 16-year-old, who asked to remain anonymous, was diagnosed with autism when she was 15, following a decade-long battle for a diagnosis. However, she said a lack of support services after her diagnosis left her family to struggle. She said, I felt no one was listening, so what's the point in being here? It felt like it couldn't get any worse. I couldn't keep waking up each morning and feeling this way. I felt trapped in a cycle of negativity. Everyone in the family found things really difficult. Our support has been severely limited. You can tell people want to help me, but they won't listen to my mum and dad about a carer's budget. She's homeschooled, but hopes to transfer to a specialist school on the island. However, her application was refused by the Isle of Wight Council, she claims because she does not have any speech or language difficulties. In the meantime, the family has been left in limbo, unsure whether she will be able to start school in September. All of this has made my mental health worse, she said. We all really wanted me to be in a place by September, but that's not going to happen. The family say they've had multiple caseworkers and feel as if they've been pushed from pillar to post. Her mother said she was felt she felt helpless watching her daughter struggle with depression. I'm the person watching her 24-7. We don't go out of the house. It's just awful, she said. Watching your own child being so desperate they want to hurt themselves or kill themselves, I felt really helpless. The council said it didn't comment on individual cases. A spokesperson said, Many children have additional needs and disabilities, and some are more severely affected than others. Some disabled children and their parents will need practical support, both inside and outside the home. The Isle of Wight Council has published a local offer which provides information about the provision available for children with additional needs and disabilities on the island. The offer also provides details about children's social care services. Parents and carers have the right to ask for their child's needs to be assessed by social care services and to ask for a carer's assessment for themselves. A needs-based assessment could lead to services for a disabled child being provided or services to help parents and carers. Brexit uncertainty worries farmers. Faced with an uncertain future and a lack of seasonal agricultural workers who may view the country as less welcoming after Brexit, Isle of Wight farmers have mixed feelings about leaving the EU. National Farmers Union, NFU, Isle of Wight Chair Matt Legg and other members of the island's farming community met MP Bob Seeley this week to discuss the forthcoming Agriculture Bill and the industry's future after Brexit. He said, We have mixed feelings. The main problem is the unknown. We are trying to plan for next year and beyond, but we don't know where we're going to be selling or what the markets will be. Another issue is soft fruit growers are struggling to find pickers. The island has struggled to find asparagus pickers this year, I think we are seen as a slightly less welcoming country because of Brexit and a lot of workers who would have come here are going elsewhere instead. 
Mr Legg called for the reintroduction of temporary work permits for seasonal agricultural workers, something Mr Seeley said he would discuss with ministers. In the wake of headlines about stockpiling food if Britain crashes out of the EU without a deal, Mr Legg said food security had overtaken environmental issues as the most pressing concern. We all support the green agenda, but we do that we have to be in but to do that we have to be in the red. We have to earn our core business and this is food for the nation. It's critical, he said. Mr Seeley said protecting small producers was key due to the importance of food, tourism, as well as production, and has asked island farmers to draw up a wish list he will take back to government. People want certainty, and I totally get that. Brexit negotiations have not been perfect, and frankly, the EU has not been particularly helpful. But we are going to try to get the best arrangement we can, and I hope we will get that certainty in the next year. Staplers Road in Newport was closed overnight after a car crashed into a tree. Emergency crews were called to the scene shortly after midnight on Tuesday. A police spokesperson said the car, a Ford Fiesta, was found off the road after hitting the tree. No one was with the car, but officers later tracked down and spoke to the driver. For my warrior husband. A Ventnor woman has raised more than £9,000 after swimming the Solent for her warrior husband, who has been diagnosed with a life-limiting condition. Karen Back was met with rapturous cheering and banner waving by friends and family when she completed the challenge last Friday after months of training. Among those there to greet her was husband David, their children Daniel, 13, and Georgia, 11, and golden retriever Bentley, a retired ability dog. Karen, 48, swam from Gosport to Ride, a distance of approximately five kilometres in just two hours to raise funds for the two charities, the Ian Pratt Motor Neuron Disease MND Foundation, which organised the swim, and the progressive Supranuclear Palsy Association, sorry, PSPA, which now has a presence on the island and supports people such as David with PSP. Family friends Liz Edmonds Lamb and Karen Penn also decided to swim and support the same charities, adding a further £1,750. David, 59, a successful businessman who ran an architectural practice in London for 27 years, is also an acclaimed wildlife photographer who raised money towards saving rhinos in Zambia, India and Sumatra. In 2012, there was a noticeable change in him, which was at first attributed to work-related stress. But after a deterioration came the crushing diagnosis in 2015 of PSP, a rare disease with an average life expectancy of seven years from the onset. The family have had a lot of adjusting to do and have made significant modifications to their home and lifestyle. Since diagnosis, David has lost much of his sight and mobility and his speech is becoming slower and less coherent. Karen said, despite all of this, David has managed to retain his great sense of humour and there is still much laughter and happiness in our household. Long may it last. I did the swim because it felt good to be doing something positive for my brave husband, whose life has been so cruelly compromised by this awful disease. The Ian Pratt MND Foundation has a wonderful concept of angels and warriors. Angels are those who have fought their battle courageously and now fly free of its burdens, while warriors are those who currently live and battle with their condition every day. I borrowed this concept for PSP and swam for my warrior and soulmate David. 
Thank you to all our family and long-standing friends who've supported us throughout this unexpected journey, both locally and afar. During this time, we have also met some wonderful new friends whose kindness and care has been overwhelming. People can still donate at tinyurl com forward slash ycpn Y-P-F-E. And that concludes part one of your talking newspaper for today. So it's goodbye, best wishes from Howard. And it's goodbye from Chris. Hi. Hello. Here we are again with Weekender. I'm Sarah. And I'm Paul. I'm going to start with some letters. A letter from Jenny Wade at Ride. Risable indeed. Can I be the only person to have found Councillor Dave Stewart's comments in the County Press 27th of July risable when he said of Chief Executive John Metcalf, we have given the Chief Executive the tool to do the job. If he doesn't do it, he doesn't have a job. He's on probation in that sense. When commenting on the decision to rubber stamp the £400,000 management shake-up at County Hall, Will Councillor Stewart do the decent thing and also consider himself to be on probation? And if this shake-up doesn't produce the required results within the remaining life of this council, resign his post too. Let us not forget this is not a one-off payment, but an ongoing year-on cost to Isle of Wight taxpayers. So, are we to believe these new senior posts are being occupied by new staff, recruited for the purpose of bringing much-needed expertise into the council's woefully inadequate structure, or, as the rumour machine is indicating, are most of these posts actually to be filled by existing members of the council's senior management team in a sideways shuffle. An indication of just how woefully inadequate the current council's management thinking was highlighted in another article in the same edition of the paper. This time it's to do with the regeneration of the island, Six sites have been identified as key to starting this process. One is the Nicholson Road Industrial Estate in Ride. Councillor Stuart Hutchinson is quoted as saying, It's at an early stage, but we have already committed money to put the site into the right state of preparation for developers. Why has money already been committed to site preparation when no consultation has been undertaken, let alone agreed? Where the road infrastructure is concerned, the Deputy Director of Regeneration told a local meeting in January 2018, expansion of this site will fall at the first hurdle if the roads around Nicholson Road aren't improved first. This means major changes are needed to Smallbrook Lane, Great Peston Road and Westridge Cross Junction, plus a new link road that has to be built within the site before expansion can go ahead. On current form, it could be years before anything is done to upgrade these roads, and this is just one obstacle to expanding this one site. Multiply that by all the obstacles surrounding the other five sites that have also been earmarked, and everyone will still only be talking about it in another 25 years, as we already have been for some of these sites for the past 25 years. Here's a letter from John Sparrow of Bembridge. The County Press publishes occasional so-called avatorials, paid-for content placed by Smart Energy GB to extol the virtues of smart meters for gas and electricity. These self-styled journalistic investigations never mention the underlying capability of smart meters to vary the cost of gas and electricity at peak times, At last, Scottish Power, one of the big six energy companies, has admitted to surge pricing their intention to change tariffs every half an hour, making it more expensive to cook, watch TV, etc. at peak times, including mornings, evenings and over Christmas. With this in mind, can readers now expect to see health warnings or some appropriate unpaid-for editorial in the county press 
explaining the real reason for the introduction of smart meters, which, which is, of course, increased income for the likes of Centrica, that's British Gas, EDF Energy, E.ON and N Power, Scottish Power and SSE. A letter from WH Bromwich at Cowes. Deliberate crisis. In recent weeks we have heard about a plight of many families awaiting autism diagnosis by mainland providers. Now we are learning about delays with cancer diagnosis and treatment when islanders are referred to Southampton and Portsmouth. Clearly there is a serious problem with stretched mainland hospitals being able to provide key health services for islanders. The quest to continually downsize St Mary's in an attempt to make budgetary savings is a flawed model that is likely to endanger or shorten many islanders' lives. The island is particularly fortunate in having many caring and dedicated staff working in our NHS. They need to be supported and given the necessary resources to provide high quality care for our community, where and whenever possible here on the island. I believe St Mary's deficit is a deliberately engineered crisis designed to pressurise the effective closure of many services. It needs to be written off by the government with new money invested to re-establish an island hospital that is capable of meeting the basic health needs of our island community and seasonal visitors. In a manner it doesn't simply aspire to be good but recreates what St Mary's Hospital once was excellent. Uh, here's a letter from Barry A, Constable of Newport. Reading the letter from Chris Bull of the 27th of July in the County Press, I found the historical contents of his letter most interesting. Maybe there might be some advantages to an independent Isle of Wight, but does he really think we have the right kind and mix of people on the island that could apply low taxation and create our own laws for the benefit of all island residents? We only need to look no further than the present bunch currently occupying County Hall to understand what I mean. A council which considers spending £400,000 on more senior managers is more important than the health and well-being of island residents in general, the sick, the vulnerable and the disabled. A council which closes public toilets is proposing less road sweeping and cleaning, less emptying of dog, dog bins. What price health and hygiene? What does that all say to tourists and holiday makers to the island? If this council is an example of possible future lawmakers, then things do not bode well. Perhaps we could persuade Donald Trump to be our president. At least we'd, we, would, we, would, um, we would have a face known to all that could, could be lampooned instead of the current lot, who I dare say few people would recognise if they saw them in the street. Right, there's um, a letter from Rob Young, Swanmore. Tribute to Mary Ellis needed it. The sound of a rumbling V8 coming down Pier Street, sand down in the late 50s, was to say the least rare. It meant only one thing. Mary Ellis was arriving in her allard. No mundane morrisal forward for her. She was visiting my mother who at that time was running the Royal Pier Hotel. I have no idea what the reason for these frequent visits was. But I do remember they involved a consumption of a number of gin and tonics. Now that wonderful lady has taken her last flight, could there not be a permanent reminder of such a unique personality? Could Sandown Airport, which was such an important part of Mary's life, be renamed Ellis Airport Sandown? Here's a letter from Trevor Gale of Gosport. Last Friday I travelled from Gosport to Ventnor to listen to Thomas Luke on the piano. What a fantastic young person who's only 14. Not only could he play the most lovely pieces by Chopin and Bach, but he was able to talk about the composers' lives in much detail. 
Thomas is a great credit to himself and his family and will reach great heights in his future career. Right, a um, letter from Helen Sinclair, founder of Friends of the Animals. Muzzle available. I was so sorry to read of the injuries to Anne Hughes' small dog, Molly, on Colware Beach in the county press 27th of July. It was clearly a distressing experience for both the owner and the poor dog, and we would like to offer Anne help towards the resulting veterinary bill, provided that it hasn't already been paid by the owners of the attacking dog. Sorry to say that lightning doesn't strike twice, and the owner of the aggressor is welcome to call at our base on Riverway and choose a muzzle free of charge from the selection we have there. Our office is open Tuesday to Saturday from 10 a.m. and the number is 522511. Ah, here's a letter about uh, th this dry summer from Keith Hook of Wooden Bridge. After keeping a rainfall chart for 25 years in Wooden Bridge, July the 23rd, 2018 was a record. The last time I'd entered a rainfall on my chart was May the 23rd, 2018. Two whole months without rain and a totally dry June. Right, we now move on to looking back. I'm starting with 100 years ago, August the 3rd, 1918. A children's pageant was held in cows in aid of the orphans of servicemen in the grounds of Northwood House. A very large attendance admired an array of charming pictures of young life through the ages. The show was opened by Lady Baring, who was introduced by the Reverend Miles C. Berkeley and given a bouquet of pink carnations. Also, the same year, Admiral Viscount Jellicoe's son and heir was baptised at St Lawrence Church. The family, who had been staying at St Lawrence Hall, attracted large crowds to the church. A guard of honour composed of wounded soldiers from the Red Cross was stationed at the entrance, and Lord Jellicoe said he was very pleased to see the men there. This is 75 years ago. Lieutenant Ger Gerald Jones, an island man who had been captured in the war, described his journey in a letter to his parents. The letter, which had taken five months to arrive, said he and others were marched 15 miles to Tunis with no food after they were captured. They were flown to Sicily before taking a boat across to mainland Italy, then up to the camp from where he was writing. Also, 75 years ago, a wing commander from Cowes, Oliver Godfrey, was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross posthumously. Godfrey acted as captain of aircraft on 28 occasions and participated in attacks on a wide range of enemy, enemy targets. The officer's high operational record, together with his excellent leadership, was branded an inspiration. We now move to 50 years ago, July 27th, 1968. 100 years after Queen Victoria incorporated the borough of Ryde, the Admiral of the Fleet, Earl Mountbatten of Burma, was the guest of honour at the Town Hall's banquet. The centenary was also marked by an exhibition at the Hall, a variety of social and sporting activities and a civic church parade. Also, support for the island's two cottage hospitals, Shanklin Cottage and the Frank James East House, was apparent at a meeting of the Isle of Wight National Health Executive Council. The chairman of the board said there was a feeling at the ministry cottage hospitals had had their day. However, Islanders said they were more convenient and provided a community hub. Uh, 25 years ago, hard, hard drugs were found during a search at Parkhurst which was sparked by two drug overdoses in the prison in the past fortnight. Prison Governor John Marriott said his staff were taking measures to stamp out the trend following the discovery of heroin. A number of prisoners were put in isolation and Mr Marriott appealed directly to the inmates to create a drug-free environment for the sake of everyone. Also, 
25 years ago, a nautical royal double visited the island as Prince Philip helped Seaview Yacht Club celebrate its centenary and Princess Royal visited Cowes to open the UK Sailing Centre's new training facilities. Seaview villagers turned out in force to catch sight of Prince Philip as he, as he made his way to the Yacht Club. They were not disappointed as he stopped and chatted to many of those lining the route. We now move to 10 years ago, August the 1st, 2008. Traders spoke of their fury at council plans to corral Cowsweek revellers into pens, either side of the Medina, after firework night. The scheme aimed at controlling the numbers boarding the floating bridge was branded excessive and demeaning. Shops claimed they would lose business because of pedestrian diversion and town councillors were angry they were not consulted. Also, same year, an amateur photographer who slipped down a cliff at St Lawrence laid in thick undergrowth for more than 36 hours before he was rescued. Mike Howell's calls for help were heard by dog water Roger Silsbury, who raised the alarm. Mr Howell endured severe thunderstorms during his two-night ordeal, which rescuers said could have cost him his life. Over to white memories. Um, the headline is An Emotional Pilgrimage by James Wolven. A history project looking at the men commemorated on Porchfield War Memorial took two local researchers to war cemeteries across Europe. Nigel Oliver and Peter Turner, both Porchfield residents who share a keen interest in the history of the First World War, undertook the project to research the history of the men who are commemorated on the village war memorial. During their research, they found information on all ten of the men commemorated and also discovered three more men who are not listed on the memorial. They discovered the Porchfield men were buried or commemorated in France, Belgium, the UK, Turkey and Palestine. The pair limited their visits to those men buried in the Commonwealth war graves in France, the Somme, and Belgium, Passchendaele. With them, they took wreaths to lay at the graves on behalf of the people of Porchfield. Mr Turner said, It was a very emotional trip. It's hard to comprehend from a time of peace the horror of a battlefield. It was mind-blowing, so much to take in. It's interesting to do research on the soldiers. After a while, you begin to feel as if you know them. Below is some of Nigel and Peter's research, those men buried in France. Private Christopher Bucket was buried at Flesquier Hill British Cemetery, aged 25. He was a local boy who grew up in the village and lived in what was Goosegate Cottage in Elmsworth Lane. He died on November the 22nd, 1917. This French village was attacked on November the 20th, 1917 with the, with the support of tanks in the Battle of Cambrai. So there's a strong possibility Private Bucket was involved in this action. Private Geoffrey William Edward Greater Rex is commemorated on the Villa Bretano Memorial. He was aged 20. Although born in England, his father, a vicar who played cricket for England, emigrated to Australia. Therefore, it is possible Private Greater Rex never visited Porchfield as he enlisted in Australia. However, his aunts, the Gibson sisters, were influential within the Porchfield's political and religious scene and may have wanted his name remembered on the memorial. Private Greta Rix was killed in action on April the 24th, 1918. 
He had only been in France one month. His body has never been found. Private Charles Edward Osborne is commemorated on the Vie en Artois Memorial and was aged 18. In 1911, Charles was living in Brook Cottages, a prize winner for gardening at the school in Lock Screen in 1912. Six years later, he was killed in action in the Battle of Arras. His body was never found. Private Walter Edward Goodman was buried in St. Emily Valley Cemetery, Villiers-Faucon. Private Goodman is another man who may not have lived in the village. He enlisted at Brockenhurst and lived at Hurst Castle. He was awarded the military medal. He was killed in action on March the 24th, 1918, aged 22. Private Alfred William Stevens lived at the Bunce Hill end of the village and died in Rouen, most likely from wounds received on the Western Front. Rouen was the centre for hospitals during the First World War. He's buried in the St. Sever Cemetery extension. Unfortunately, Nigel and Peter could not visit this cemetery. Those men buried in Belgium, Private George Pragnall, commemorated on the Manin Gate in Ypres. George was 42 when he was killed on May the 13th, 1915, in what would have been the Second Battle of Ypres. His body was never found and is one of the 54,000 soldiers named on the Manin Gate who have no known grave. Private Harry James Saunders is buried in Manginham Cemetery, Potterings. This cemetery is one of hundreds that were created at casualty clearing stations. His wife ran the local post office. Private Leonard Punch is also buried in Manginham Cemetery, Potterings. He lived in Ashen Grove, which is a good walk from Porchfield. He was the grandson of the local cobbler. For some reason, he is not commemorated on the Porchfield War Memorial. Gunner Arthur Thompson, MM, is buried at Woods Cemetery near Epes. It is more than likely he was killed on September the 17th, 1917, in the Third Battle of Epes. He is listed as living in Norfolk Cottages, Trafalgar Road, Newport. Nothing is known of why he received a military medal but this would have been more than likely been issued as a decoration for bravery. Those men buried in the UK. Gunner Albert Edward Ford is buried in the Parkhurst Military Cemetery, Newport. He died at home as a result of contracting malaria in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq. As well as being remembered on the Porchfield War Memorial, he is also remembered on the Newport Drill Hall Memorial, and the Freshwater Memorial Hall Memorial. <laughs> These two memorials pay tribute to the men who were involved in the Siege of Cut, December 3rd, 1915 to April 29th, 1916. Private Henry Pragnell of the Royal Marine Light Infantry, who was not remembered on the Portfield War Memorial, was one of the family who lived at Lower Elmsworth Brickyard. He was killed on April 24th, 1918, and is buried at Chatham, Maidstone Road Cemetery. Those buried in Turkey. Rifleman Bertie Bennett is buried at Hadir Pasha Cemetery, Istanbul. The son of the local baker, he was prisoner of war, having been captured in Palestine. His grave is alongside 6,000 graves of the Crimean War mostly the result of a cholera epidemic. Private Oliver Harding Watchingwell is commemorated on the Hells Memorial. It stands on the tip of the Gallipoli Peninsula. It takes the form of an obelisk more than 30 metres high that can be seen by ships passing through the Dardanelles. There are more than 20,000 men named on this memorial who have no known grave. This trip was sponsored by Apex Glass Systems, 
John Heather at the NFU Porchfield Cricket Club and the Village Hall Porchfield. Over to My View by Alan Marriott. Uh, headline is What Can We Do to Save Our High Street? I try not to live up to the image of the cynical hack. Really, really, I do. But when such a free hit is delivered in the form of the news, Newport is in the running for High Street of the Year, it is just too hard to resist. And yes, I know it's talking about more than just the main road through the town centre. And yes, I recognise the squares are very presentable. And Node Hill is a cornucopia of quirky small shops. But surely the clue is in the title. And if you start a stroll up near the Crispin pub, and walk all the way down to County Hall, probably to demand of Councillor Wayne Whittle, what were you thinking of getting involved in this? I'm pretty sure you'll find little to reassure you the island's county town is a shoe in for this little contest. I took such a stroll the other day. And aside from the large gaps created by closures of stores, such as HMV and the Building Society on the corner of St James's Square, I would wager you won't find much to challenge quirky high streets seen elsewhere on the mainland. And dare I say it, even on the island. Half a dozen charity shops, a similar number of bargain basement establishments, plus phone shops, etc., hardly make for retail paradise. Granted, there is the occasional gem, such as the timeless George Bull luggage shop, family-owned opticians and Jack's hair and beauty salon. But the rest is hardly high street Oscar material. What's to be done to improve the situation? No one could possibly suggest making a high street silk purse out of a sow's ear is easy in 2018. We know the supermarkets stock everything from paint to pansies and the internet makes it easy to have it all delivered from your armchair. Creativity is required and a reinvention of the high street as a leisure recreation area. And dare I say it, as part of the council regeneration agenda, a fresh look at traffic flow and even that Marmite topic, pedestrianisation, then maybe, just maybe, we could have a Leicester City in the Premier League chance of winning high. As an article by Jonathan Young, there's no such thing as a free PFI lunch. Poking around in a dusty corner of the Isle of Wight Council website, I came across something which brought the memories flooding back. The month was January 2013 and the venue Ventnor Botanic Garden, where the Great White Hope, aka the Highways PFI scheme, was launched with a great deal of razzmatazz and unbridled optimism. Cheerleaders included Edward Giles, the responsible cabinet member Stuart Love, the responsible service director, and of course J. Just Surrender, the PFI programme director, who was up to sticks within months, his job apparently done. I say apparently because now JJ is back to pick up the pieces and to be paid very handsomely for doing so. So what has gone wrong? Why is it exactly the grand plan which promised so much but has been beset by problems since day one, is now on life support. Its bells and whistles being stripped away in the name of austerity, while the island's roads seem to be in large part no better than they were five years ago. The presentation from those 2013 road shows has been left lying around, somewhat carelessly one might think, 
and reminds us of what it was we were promised. Good news, all of the island's highways network was to be upgraded in the first seven years, every last mile of it, with the help of loads of free drafts from the government. We would end up with the best roads in the whole country, of course we would. The presenting team got a bit carried away. Many of our roads started as cart tracks. They were going to be stripped down to bare earth and rebuilt. We've now barely 20 months of those seven years to go, including two winters. Hands up all those who think the target is still feasible. The excuses are starting already. The actual contract, unlike that pesky presentation, does not, in fact, say all roads will be upgraded. It says they'll be brought up to an acceptable standard. Different thing altogether, of course. Depending on what you think acceptable means, and there's no mention at all of those cart tracks. Councillor Giles and Mr Love weren't far behind JJ in showing the council a clean pair of heels in 2013. The former surprisingly but comprehensively UKIPped in the May elections, the latter having recently reached the top of the greasy pole at Westminster Council. But along with JJ, Councillor Giles' political brethren, out of office for the first four years of PFI, are back in, just in time to help us out with these few questions. Driving across the island on anything other than classified roads means mile after mile of untouched ruts. Very cart-like track, in fact. Time's running out. Are they really all going to be upgraded or even acceptable by March 2020? And if they're not, can we have some money back to spend on things like care support, the islands desperately disadvantaged. By your own account, only non-highway elements of the PFI contract, dog poo bins for heaven's sake, can be tinkered with to save money, for fear of the government wanting its grant back. Isn't that a pretty vicious bit of premeditated ring fencing, given everything else that's crying out for funds? And finally, when David Cameron pledged in 2009 a Tory government would usher in an age of austerity. Were any of you listening? Or did you notice he actually carried out the threat? Or think what it might mean for this PFI folly you are about to embark on? A touchy silence would not be considered an ad adequate response. Over to what's on. Headline is pyrotechnics and monkey business. Uh, the Needles is gearing up for a spectacular August, launching a month of free summer fun for visitors. The landmark attraction will host live music and entertainment throughout this month, with the highlights being a weekly pyrotechnic display set to music and the visit of Chuck the Chimp. <laughs> Taking place every Thursday from August the 2nd to August the 30th. Music and magic in the skies promises a spectacular new show. This free family event will also raise awareness and funds for a range of island causes. Also new at the Needles will be appearances by Chuck, one of the only two animatronics apes visiting the UK this summer. Every Monday to Thursday throughout August, Chuck will be touring the site, meeting families and making friends. Marina Zanti, general manager at the Needles landmark attraction, said the summer is in full swing and we're all preparing for the start of our weekly Paro musical extravaganza, a completely new show from those we've held in previous years, which promises to be almost as spectacular as the needles themselves. Uh, there's a note, visitors only need to pay for parking, the entertainment is completely free. Free and fabulous at the Fringe. For free entertainment during the summer, head to Ventnor Fringe 
for its madcap, unusual and inspiring offerings. Although there are 70 ticketed shows, there's loads to do without having to fork out. Ventnor Fringe runs from Tuesday to Sunday, August the 12th. Jack Barnes is heading up the three events, and he here is his five top choices. The Book Bus. This is a beautiful 1930s Parisian bus that has been converted into a bookshop. Each day there will be a wide range of fun activities for the whole family, from storytellers and musicians to theatre productions. The book bus is a creative hub and a perfect place to escape to. It is open from 10am to 6pm daily, plus a mystery late night event. There's a children's storytelling hour at 11am each day. Find the book bus at St Catherine's Church. See a gig in the laundrette. Ever seen a band perform in the laundrette? Well, now's your chance. Most evenings there will be a gig in Ventnor's Laundrette in Spring Hill. Celebrate Carnival. Join the colourful madness of Ventnor Carnival in its 129th year. Parade into the streets on Wednesday and next Saturday, August the 11th. Cutting edge art in the front room. Ventnor's own art house life is one of many homes that will be transformed and open to the public to present new work from artists. There will be artist talks each day and performances from artists such as Cat Skellington. Discover the future. Step into a mysterious world through a secret entrance hidden somewhere in Parkside and join Doris Dodo in a creepy, immersive experience in which Doris and her team of ghostly characters allow you to experience your own funeral alongside other creepy activities. Take a walk around Ventnor during the Fringe and see what you can discover. Uh, here's news. This is for tomorrow of an open day at the Apollo Theatre <coughs> at Pyle Street in Newport. The Apollo Theatre welcomes all visitors to its open day on Saturday the 4th of August. Between 10am and 4pm the theatre on Pyle Street, Newport, will be showcasing all that goes together to make up a thriving theatre, as well as short performances throughout the day. And visitors will be able to learn about costuming a show, about the youth theatre, front of house roles, set design, construction and much more. There will be opportunities to talk to theatre volunteers and members of the committee about the history of this lovely building and how the theatre operates today. Then, in the evening from 6pm, there'll be a social gathering and a barbecue. Whether you would like to get involved on or off stage, or just com enjoy coming along to our shows, here's your chance to find out more about the Apollo Theatre, a dedicated theatre with its own resident amateur group. There's a few shows uh, during this month, August, at Shanklin Theatre. Tonight is the Searchers in concert, brings back memories. Mm. <laughs> Wednesday the 8th, the Fab Beatles. Thursday the 9th, Beyond the West End. Wednesday the 15th, Carpenter's Gold. Friday the 17th, Shibwadi Wadi. Wednesday the 22nd, Jive Talking, obviously a, a Bee Gees tribute. Thursday the 23rd, Beyond the West End. Friday the 24th, A Country Night in Nashville. Saturday the 25th, Jay McDonald celebrates 20 years. Tuesday the 28th, Forever in Blue Jeans. Wednesday the 29th, Joe Pasquale. Thursday the 30th, Beyond the West End. The box office number is 868000. Or you can book online www.shanklintheatre, all one word, lowercase, dot com. And this is information about a choir. The Rainbow White Singers 
meet on Wednesdays at All Saints Church Hall ride from 1.30 p.m. to 3.30. The sessions are informal and there are no auditions. The weekly fee is £3, which includes refreshments. For details, call musical director Ada Coleman on 868 546. I'm afraid that's all for us today, so it's goodbye from Paul. And goodbye from Sarah. This is the BBC. This is In Touch, the magazine programme for people like me who are blind or partially sighted. I'm Peter White. Thanks for downloading this week's edition. Good evening. The air is thick with promises about a better transport deal for disabled people on trains, on buses, at airports and on the streets themselves. So on tonight's programme, we'll be trying to find out how many of those promises are likely to be kept, especially the ones relevant to blind people. Later, we'll be hearing from the Chief Operating Officer at Manchester Airport about how they intend to respond to two consecutive annual reports describing their service to disabled people as poor. But first, I've been talking with Transport Minister Nusrat Ghani about their plans for what they're calling an inclusive transport strategy. It covers all forms of transport and they say their aim is for all disabled people to be able to travel with confidence by 2030. But just to get to the bus stop or the station, you have to be able to use the roads with confidence as well. One of the greatest concerns of visually impaired people at the moment has been the trend towards shared spaces. The idea is that restrictions such as traffic lights are relaxed, often there are no pavements and drivers, cyclists and pedestrians share the roadway, using their own common sense and consideration to create a more relaxed environment. Well, that's the theory, but it's an idea many blind people dislike intensely, saying it's dangerous and frightening and that they avoid routes where it's being operated. But the Department of Transport is now calling on local councils to halt shared space projects where they're still in the planning stage. Minister Nusrat Ghani told me why. I know that shared spaces work very well for those individuals that are disabled and in a wheelchair, but it doesn't work for all. And what we don't want to do in any way is to knock back the confidence of people with disabilities, including those with visual impairment, not to go out of their home and use public transport. A lot of visually impaired people just think they are intrinsically dangerous and would like to see this idea dropped altogether. Any chance you might do that? Well, you know, it might come to that. It might come to that, but we need to just do a bit more research into it. Shared spaces in themselves can be quite varied. And I know that in my own constituency, when research was undertaken, they focused mostly on those in wheelchairs and not those with visual impairment. So unfortunately, poor decisions can be made. The concern that they have, has been addressed and we will ensure that when the street design is being taken forward that all disability groups are accounted for and their needs are understood. Let's talk about trains. It's still necessary in many cases for blind people to book your assistance for your journey in advance. A lot of blind people would say that's not equality, is it? Many people would like simply up and go like everyone else and be able to depend on appropriate assistance. An inclusive transport strategy is going to update passenger assist. You know, when you are arriving at a train station and you've booked through passenger assist, all parts of that journey should be honoured. And if they're not, the passenger should be compensated. Two other points, if I, if I may. The Access for All programme, we've just put out another £300 million of funding to enable our very old Victorian stations to become step-free access. And then, of course, you've got the Disabled People's Protection Policy. We basically lays out the, the sort of service that you should expect and we're working with the officer and Rod Durrell, for example to ensure that when this service isn't up to scratch that um, train operating companies can be held to account to make all of those processes a lot easier are absolutely key. Would you accept the principle that you ought to be able to get to a station and and depend on, on help because often you don't know what help you're going to need till you get there. Yeah, absolutely, which is why we are saying very clearly that disability awareness training just has to improve, has to improve, and we, make, we need to make sure that we respond to all of our passengers and if there are issues that are raised that they dealt with quickly. 
on the issue of technology, I mean, blind people want to be as independent as possible and do things for themselves. But increasingly, the technology, for instance, say for buying tickets on stations is inaccessible. You know, ticket machines with flat screens, no buttons, not helpful. Agreed, absolutely agreed, which is why the, there is a, a huge segment in inclusive transport strategy, the disability awareness training element through the management structure. If you are responsible for transport, at the very top, at the management team, you need to understand what all of your passengers' needs are. The fear is that if the technology isn't accessible, there may also not always be the staff. What guarantees can you give that, that staffing on stations won't be cut? You're absolutely right. You need the right amount of staff on a station um, and, and that will continue as well. But you need the staff to be appropriately trained. So it's about having staff that are connected up and um, staff are able to do their job because they've had the right training to help people with disabilities. But what about staff on trains as well? Because a lot of the disputes we've had recently between unions and rail companies have been about that. There is a worry that the train companies, in order to you know, bring their franchises in at an affordable cost, will want to cut staff in that way. Whereas visually impaired people, I suspect most of us would like to feel we could be sure of assistance on the trains themselves. Well, there there will always uh, be a second person on the train and you would hope that... So are you agreeing with the unions that actually they need the staff on these trains, keeping to the level at least that they've got at the moment? Well, that is for the, the you know the train operating companies to to make that decision going forward. But you know, having the, the having the right investment in our in our stations, having the right investment in our buses, having the right attitude towards how we manage our road infrastructure to help people continue and and start and end their journeys is absolutely key as well. Let, let's just quickly talk about bus services as well. One of the good advances in, in recent times has been uh, audio announcement on buses. It's great where it happens. It's still patchy. Are there plans to make it universal? We are providing an extra £2 million for audio and visual equipment on buses. I'm very lucky I visited Brighton Buses and they've got a fantastic service on their buses. So we're, we're hoping that that will be picked up and, and taken forward. The, the bus companies I meet and the local authorities I meet are ambitious. So it's just ensuring that when these decisions are made, that the information is provided in a way that will work for lots of people, including those with disabilities. And just one more point on taxis. Guide dog owners are still telling us that they're often finding themselves refused cabs. It's illegal, but it still happens and prosecutions are rare. This report is full of great aspirations, but enforcement is key, isn't it? First of all, it's wrong, like you said, and it should not be taking place. I actually spoke to the auto party group on disability uh, just a few months ago and um, one of the the members was late to the meeting because a cab um, refused to pick her up you are right it is illegal which is why we have made it very clear to licensing authorities that they need to do their job you know they are able to fine cab drivers and they are also able to take licenses away the fact that we are tackling it again with the inclusive transport strategy and reminding people not only of what their rights are but also licensing authorities of what their obligations are is absolutely key as well. Transport Minister Nusrat Ghani. The strategy is also promising improvements in the assistance we can expect at airports. Concerns about this were discussed on the programme when we covered a report by the Civil Aviation Authority. That said that though many airports were improving, some still had a way to go. And one of them was Manchester. Their services for disabled people were described as poor for the second year in a row. Tricia Williams is the airport's chief operating officer. Well, clearly we are, as an airport, very disappointed. I'm personally disappointed as a, as a leader, as part of the airport. And we're completely committed to improving our performance in this area and have actually taken a number of steps already. So we are seeing that improvement coming through already. Because it was poor last year as well, wasn't it? It was. And, and what actually happened as a result of last year's performance was a, a, an amount of money was actually agreed with the airlines to put back into the service. And that has, ha- has actually led to, um, for example, more wheelchairs, more people who can assist, and a long list of, of additional resource. But unfortunately, that didn't um, bear fruit as, as quickly as, as we would have wanted to. But I'm confident that that will change and is changing already. 
Well, the two issues you mentioned there where the money has gone are very relevant to the things I'd like to talk about because they relate directly to, to visually impaired people. One it is a tendency to leave us at crucial moments without information about what's going on. We're almost warehoused with no way of checking whether we've been forgotten or whether our flight's been called. It's happened frequently to me in Manchester, I have to say. Why does that happen? Oh, I, I do apologise for that. I think we've had some learning um, around passengers with hidden disabilities or with disabilities that aren't to do with mobility. So um, the service originally started as um, passengers who re required assistance from a mobility point of view. And now we, we are changing and we have recognised passengers need all types of different assistance. And what we've done now is we've um, added additional um, customer service assistance, we've added additional help points located in and around the airport. We've actually installed very recently audio devices in our accessible toilets across each of the terminals. We've got three terminals here and over the last year we've actually assisted nearly 7,000 visually impaired passengers. We've got a quarterly accessibility forum and we have input there from the, the guide dogs for the blind association. So I do believe we, um, we are improving and we are listening we, we, we haven't got everything right and I do apologise for that. Um, we were disappointed in our performance and we are committed to improving that. So whatever feedback um, anybody, any of your listeners or yourself want to give us, we are um, focused and, and um, definitely committed to improving in this area. Well, let me give you a bit of feedback now. Most of us carry phones. Um, can't we be given a number to call so that we don't have to try and find our way back to a desk to see if they've forgotten all about us. And I would expect that as standard, really, well, well, that we should be given that, and, and I will pick that up if that, wasn't, if that wasn't the case. No one has ever offered me a phone number to call in that situation, and I don't know of anybody who has been offered right. that. Right, well, I, I will pick that up. I think that's uh, something we should be able to, to set up pretty quickly. Um, can we talk about wheelchairs as well, course, in relation yeah. to visually impaired people? Um, we told people on the programme a couple of weeks ago about the partially sighted woman presented with no alternative to being conveyed in a wheelchair when she landed, though she didn't need this and she found it embarrassing. Uh, now, we know for some visually impaired people, this wouldn't have been a problem. They might be elderly, they might lack confidence or they might just not care. But for many, it feels inappropriate. Why does that continue to happen? It shouldn't. And I, and I do believe um, OCS, who provide the service for us here at Manchester, actually said that that was a mistake and it shouldn't have happened and it, and it shouldn't happen. People who are visually impaired and don't require a wheelchair shouldn't be offered a wheelchair. They should be given assistance through um, a customer care agent, for example. That should have happened. I should say, not everyone is unhappy with Manchester. Uh, Martin Conway, who's visually impaired, got in touch to say his experiences didn't reflect uh, the um, portrayal of Manchester in the CAA report and, and that he'd had a lot of good experiences and thought the service had improved. So it can be done, which leads me to ask, what is the problem? Is it not enough money to provide staff or is it not enough understanding that different disabled people have varying needs? I think last year it was probably a combination of both. I think we definitely um, needed to put more resource and more investment into the service and we've got 133 additional customer care agents now so we, it shouldn't be the, the case that we don't have enough resource. We've set up a, an engagement forum and actually setting that disability engagement forum up and meeting regularly gives us a better insight into what passengers need. So I think we have been delivering um, a good service for a certain number of passengers and I'm glad to hear that somebody's actually acknowledged that um, but clearly we've got more work to do and, and I think the improvement plan we've got in place will make sure that we are more ahead of the game rather than catching up in the future. Tricia Williams and we'll keep next year's report on our radar. Finally another warning shot this time for high-tech companies across the Atlantic. America's National Federation for the Blind has filed a complaint with the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination. It's about a major American software firm and is relevant to us because Epic Systems Corporation is making relationships with some NHS trusts in the UK. Chris Danielson of the American NFB 
told me more about the case. We've got a company, Epic Systems Corporation, that has software that it deploys to hospitals, clinics, other healthcare entities here in the United States where blind people are working. That software doesn't work with what is called screen reader technology or screen access technology. Healthcare facilities have bought these shiny new systems from Epic and all of a sudden that accessibility has disappeared. You got to remember that there are a significant number of blind people who are employed in that industry. For example, as medical transcriptionists. That's a job that blind people were very often steered to by rehabilitation agencies because, of course, at one time it was an easy job for a blind person to do. Now, Epic have told us that uh, they do work to integrate with assistive technologies, including broad support for screen readers, uh, to the maximum extent possible uh, on different versions of technology. Um, how do you react to that? Is that good enough? I, I don't think it is. I don't want to say that Epic doesn't have good intentions necessarily, but... Our understanding is that there's often some attempt to script uh, the implementation of Epic's system, basically customizing the screen reader, the individual blind person's screen reader, so that it works better with Epic software. Uh, that process, however, doesn't always take place in a timely manner, and we believe that there needs to be systemic change at Epic. Our Concern is that there may well be an individual accommodation model happening, but that that's not sufficient to meet the problem and to allow blind people to continue to, in, in a lot of cases, maintain employment that they already have. They've got a job and suddenly they can't do it effectively. What could be the result of this? What's the status of this case you're bringing and could it establish a precedent? One of the things that the MCAD can do is say that a lawsuit can go forward. And if a lawsuit does go forward, then that has the potential to set precedent. The other thing that could happen is that the MCAD as I understand it, could make a ruling against Epic and require it to do certain things to make its software accessible for the purposes of being used in Massachusetts. But either way, the uh, industry would be put on notice that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Well, we'd like to hear from uh, listeners here if you've got examples of changes perhaps in software which are making it difficult for you to do jobs you've done before. Chris, um, the NFB in the States has a reputation for going to law. Does this make a difference? Have you found this an effective approach? Uh, yes, we have. It is not, by the way, our preferred approach. We, we tend to get publicity when we go to the courts. We have a very good track record in court of addressing accessibility in this way. We also have a very good track record of partnering with organizations that we have not litigated with, like Expedia, for example. But we do whatever is necessary as the circumstances present themselves to get these issues addressed. And between a 60 and 70 percent unemployment rate among blind people, in the United States, the last thing we need is for blind people who have existing jobs to find that they're suddenly unable to do them and become unemployed when they were, in fact, engaged in productive work. That was Chris Danielson. Well, Epic told us that at the time of recording, they hadn't yet received a copy of the complaint. And that's it for tonight. Your comments and your stories are always welcome. You can call our action line on 0800 044 for 24 hours after the programme or email in touch at bbc.co.uk. And if you can go to our website, you can click on Contact Us. You can also download tonight's and other In Touch editions from there. From me, Peter White, producer Kevin Corr and the team, goodbye. <laughs>